And the life that is out of touch knows confusion and is overcome by perplexity. But the heart that is in relation to thee, O Lord, that heart is kept in peace. Indeed, thou art overshadowed by the Almighty. Give up thy fears and thy perplexities, and come even now to rest in the Lord. Amen. To spread the word of life through Christ to the ends of the earth, and we thank thee that still thy loving eye runs to and fro throughout the whole earth to show thyself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are upright before thee. And we think, Lord, with our human limitations of the many that are in the dark places of the earth where the living conditions are hard and where they're up against hard uh, opposition of the enemy. But Lord, this morning thine eyes upon every little piece of bungalow, upon every man and woman who's giving the gospel, we pray for them. We pray for the dear nationals in every country, and ask that the Spirit of the Lord may move mightily upon them as the doors are closing to the white missionaries. We pray that thy Spirit so mightily endure the national workers with power from on high, and keep us here just flowing into the stream with thee. We thank thee that while there are troubles, the waters of the earth are troubled, and the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, we thank thee there is a river from God that maketh glad the city of God, the holy place of Lord, keep us in that stream. Keep us in the flow of the Spirit. May everything we have in our lives be brought in. The giving of our means to carry on. That this stream may flow into many lives. Thank thee, thank thee, thank thee for the flow of the Lord's river. Bless everyone who gives. Make this a gift unto the Lord for the carrying on of the message of Jesus. We ask for his glory and in his wonderful, triumphant name. Amen. I want Jesus to be glorified, don't you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. Oh, Emmanuel, abide with us, abide with us, come into us in an ever-deepening presence and in an ever-deepening work in our hearts and lives. We thank you for every little touch, every little breath of heaven, so sweet and so clean and so pure and so out of this world. We love your presence. We love thy kingly steps and stately moving in our midst. Oh, just wash our hearts and thoughts and every part of us now as we turn to the sacred pages of thy word where we eat and drink together in thy precious name. Meet us in thy word and around this sacred communion table. For Jesus' sake we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Shall we turn to the precious word of the Lord? I told you last Sunday morning, or perhaps two Sundays ago, every Wednesday night for some time we have been studying the Songs of Solomon. 
And the Lord has certainly been with us. This past Wednesday night was most precious in his presence. And the blessing of Wednesday night carried over until Friday night. So that Friday night was even much, much more blessed than Wednesday night. I just didn't care if I ever left this place on Friday night. His presence was so with us. And it seems to me it's carried over until this morning, too. I believe Brother Diffenworth caught it, gave it us a touch of it in his solo. Our thought was, this. I sat down under his shadow. It's wonderful to be overshadowed by God. You have to be very, very close to a person to be in their shadow, don't we? And he'd like us to abide just so close with him with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. But a previous portion we saved to share with you this morning. I felt it was the will of the Lord And then we'd like to share with the Sunday morning folks what the Lord is giving us on Wednesday night. Maybe you would like to come and join with us because the Wednesday night crowd has been constantly growing and God is with us. All right, now our portion for this morning is the first song of Solomon. I'd like to say to you, The Song of Solomon has nothing whatsoever to do with Solomon himself. Some folks are afraid of the Song of Solomon because they don't think Solomon had very much in his life to give anybody. Well, as far as Solomon himself is concerned, there are many things in his life that we disapprove of. But Solomon was anointed king. And the anointing of God rested upon his life, and he did walk with the Lord for a while. And while he was walking with God, one day the Holy Ghost came upon Solomon. Solomon was blessed with songs. He wrote over a thousand songs, or rather the Spirit through him sang over a thousand songs. And this portion of his songs is all that we have recorded. But evidently, this is the portion when it was purely of God, what came through the man. So Solomon has no more to do with the songs of Solomon than David had to do with singing his psalms. The Spirit of the Lord came on him, and and it's the Spirit of the Lord through David that sang those songs. Solomon had many more to do with it than Isaiah had when the Spirit of the Lord prophesied through Isaiah, the 53rd of Isaiah. Isaiah hadn't anything to do with it at all. It was just that the Holy Spirit flowed through Isaiah and gave to us that beautiful, beautiful prophecy, so purely God that God himself has told us that it would be fulfilled to the very jot and tittle. It's so purely spirit and of God. And so has the song of Solomon been given to us, not from Solomon, but while Solomon was in the spirit, the precious Holy Ghost flowed through that man. He hadn't anything to do with it at all, purely purely a song of the Spirit, something purely of God has to be given to us as something inspired, so purely inspired by the Spirit that it could be given to us as the Holy Word of God and not a word that Solomon himself had to give. So that's the first time I've even even mentioned Solomon for a long time only to explain that Solomon has nothing to do with the Song of Solomon. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Solomon's life. It has nothing whatsoever. There isn't one word of it that has anything to do with Solomon's wives. The whole song 
is a sort of spiritual thing concerning the heavenly bride and the bridegroom. It's all of him. The whole thing is the most spiritual bit of truth in the scriptures and can only be interpreted by the same spirit that gave it. All right, then let us come to the king and sit down with him. In the first Song of Solomon, the 12th and the 13th verses, while the king sitteth at his table, my sight nerd sendeth forth the smell thereof. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. A bundle of myrrh. Now, it's the spices. It's the spices that I want to speak to you about this morning. And the sweet ointments, the sweet fragrances that are ours at his table. While the king, while the king sitteth at his table, it calls for something from my heart. My spikener send for the smell thereof. I saved this portion because we're coming to the king's table this morning. We're coming to his table. And my heart has just been all melted before him in this little portion of his word. While the king sitteth at his table, my spite nerd sendeth forth the smell thereof. And I ask him, O oh Lord, while we sit at the table with you this morning, what has my heart to offer? What has my life to bring? What can you call forth from me this morning? Listen, beloved, when we come and sit at the table with our king this morning, I wish you'd take a good look at him. I wish you'd, I wish we would stop and take the shoes off our feet and just take time to think at whose table we're sitting. It's his table, and then with whom we're feasting. For the most part, he keeps himself hidden from us. It's very, very rarely that he ever pulls back his robe and lets us see his this one with whom we're sitting has nail wounds in his hand. And you're across the table from him. What has my hands to offer one who has nail wounds in his hands? As I come to the table this morning, I receive from his nail-wounded hand the emblem of the flesh that was rent for me. I receive from his hand his life that flowed from his wounds for me. We're sitting at the table with one whose brow is marred. And he's our living head. Our living head. All the life any of us have this morning came down from him. Any life that any of us have this morning is flowing into us now from the living head. Life from the living head. All 
that we are, he gave. All that we have, he brought. We can't see that he has a broken heart, but he has. And if we're caught up in the spirit with him, this one with whom we sit down has a broken heart. So my heart is asking, what have I this morning to bring to one with a broken heart? One with nail wounds in his hand and he invites me to come to his table. There's just one thing he asks of any of us. He chooses his hand to draw us out after him. And he waits for our decision that we'll go, that we'll go. That last night in the upper room in Jerusalem, when the king sat at his table, that very last night, how he opened his heart to his own, told them it deepest secrets at that time, the fact that he must suffer, and there's no other way through for him, he must suffer. And he calls to us, his heart calls to us, will we come after him? He gives us his gifts, he gives us his blessings. At the table, he lets us recline upon his bosom with John. We can feel his breath upon our face. We can look into those wonderful eyes. We can feel the warmth of his nature. I believe John even felt the, the pulse of his very heart. It's our privilege to get so close to him. What can I bring him? What can I bring to such a one? I can give him that that he longs for more than anything else. He has come up to the city for one thing only, and he knows it. He's on his way to a cross. He must suffer. His life must be given. It must be poured out. And as he sits there at the table, he waits for you and for me to make our decision that we will go to Calvary with him. We'll go all the way with him. We, we love his gifts and we accept his gifts. We love his blessings. We appreciate all that he does for us. And oh, it's, it's wonderful to be blessed and to be gifted and to be endued and to be loved. But when we make our decision, every communion service to me is a time of decision. It is, and it's a time to consecrate beyond any consecration we've ever made. We've come thus far. We've come safely through thus far. And the king is asking us, will we another month? Another month? It's the, it's the first Sunday. It, we're beginning again. Will we another month? Lay down our lives and give up ourselves to be poured out for him. That's what he wants. To be poured out for him. To really, when I say poured out, I really mean poured out. Because nothing else can be accepted in his presence. He cannot accept our natural goodness. He cannot accept 
all of those things that we bring to society and the unregenerate heart and life and it's accepted as sweet and loving and kind and beautiful because it's it's the goodness it's the beauty of of uh, the natural good refined man but that isn't the thing that he wants here that isn't what he could offer to the father a uh, sweet lovely good flesh god cannot accept he doesn't thank us for the gift of our goodness and our sweetness and and our loveliness in the natural that which satisfies and pleases his heart is the life laid down and the life poured out when he came before the father it wasn't his good life that was accepted he lived without sin he was good he was kind he was pure he was he helped everybody he ministered to everybody he was the most wonderful citizen in palestine he never harmed anyone he never touched any life but it wasn't his good life that was poured out before god it wasn't his sweetness and his goodness and his kindness that was accepted all that good sweet kind pure life had to be taken to calvary and crucified nailed to a cross put there in death his life had to be poured out and offered back to god and as we sit at his table no matter what is in our life of of goodness how good we are by nature how perfect we are by nature that god doesn't accept that the lord says will i just want you to do one thing bring me yourself bring me your life bring me your spirit soul and body bring me your your natural self your human spirit bring me your flesh bring me all that you are there's one thing i want to do with it and that's to take it through the process of the pouring out and giving up and yielding all in death and to death that i can change you and transform you so that all will be of grace all will be of god all will be of the fruit of the spirit in our life and we'll not be offering the lord our natural goodness but that which is of the fruit of the spirit because of the work of grace in our hearts and lives he wants that nothing can be accepted in the presence of god but what is of god god can only receive god god can only find joy in god god only takes pleasure in god god only delights in god god is only pleased with god not one single thing that any of us are or have or can bring or can offer of ourselves no matter what i am by disposition in the natural i can't offer that to god no matter what you are in your horrible terrible disposition god is no more pleased with one sweet good kind loving disposition in the natural then he is pleased with that mean hateful disposition both likewise have to be brought to the cross both have to go down in death both have to be quickened by his spirit and brought forth by his grace and be a product of the spirit of life and the work of grace in our hearts and lives all that is ever accepted by god has its origin in that incorruptible seed that he plants in our hearts and lives that is very god himself so as i sit down at the table with him all that i ever can bring to god is what divine grace has wrought out in my life and in your heart and in your life 
nothing in my hands I bring. How the Lord talked to me about that. I was the nothing. It isn't I'm coming empty-handed. I'm the nothing. I bring this nothing. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Hallelujah. And while, while he sits there and the sweet beauties and the sweet fragrances pours out from his heart and his light to us and we see who he is. You cannot be in the presence of God and our light not affected by it. You can. His presence subdues us. His presence conquers. His presence quiets. And that's what he wants to do in us. That he can sit in us, the reigning one. He can sit in our heart, conquering. He can sit in our life, ruling. He can sit in us, overshadowing, but blessing all with his wonderful presence. Praise the Lord. And then my spice nerd will flow out and flow back to him. What is my spike nerd? Any perfumes that he can bring forth? Any alabaster box? Costly? Costly? You remember when he sat at that, that meal in Bethany and Mary brought her alabaster box? Costly? Ointment? Precious? Spike nerd? Precious? Spike nerd? Precious and costly? The most precious thing, the most costly thing she had, I suppose. But she brought it and broke it and gave it. And oh, it's so wonderful to think that the fragrance of Mary's perfume is still refreshing the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, wherever this gospel is preached, that story will be told. The, oh, there's certainly nothing wasteful about that, is there? Even down to this day, Mary's alabaster box is yielding dividends and returns for the Lord Jesus. To this day, wherever the story is told, there's something more brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why my heart wants to keep on saying to all of us this morning, don't withhold yourself from the Lord. Hold back nothing from him. Don't keep yourself in any way from him, but flow out to him. Pour out to him. Let your spikenard come forth, the perfumes of your love, and then our praise and our worship, refreshing his presence and ravishing his heart. You remember what David said? David says, Thou preparest the table before me. In the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Well, we have nothing to give to anybody else until our own cup runs over. Yes, we have. Uh, we're, we're asking until our cup is running over, then we have to give. That's the difference between a prayer meeting and worship. When we come into a prayer meeting, we come empty. We come to ask. We come to pray. We come to receive. We come, oh, Lord, we're here to pray. We're here to plead. We're here to intercede. We're here to pray. But not so when we come to worship the Lord. My cup runneth over. We're worshiping, and neither can we worship the Lord until the cup does run over. When the Spirit of God comes in over a congregation, right away, folks whose cups are running over just flow right out and respond. Other cups that feel a little empty and dry just uh, aren't flowing forth as easily, aren't pouring forth so readily. I think the Savior wants us to keep our heart full of praise. Don't you? Oh, the power of praise, the returns of praise, the beauty of worship. How when he comes, when he comes and gives us of his fragrances, when he comes and pours forth to us, 
How wonderful it is. And from the other side of the table, he wants our worship. He wants our praise. He wants our devotion. Nothing could please the heart so his heart so much. And of course, we can't worship the Lord. We can't really worship him. Really worship him until we're caught up with who he is. And forget ourselves. Forget ourselves and detach from ourselves. And we flow out in worship and praise and adoration to him. And just as soon as worship and praise to the Lord flows forth, listen, never ever do we bring him an offering that he doesn't bring us one. Never. Never. You just let your spikenard begin to flow, and right away another fragrance will fill the air. What is it? That bundle of myrrh, she says, was with me all through the night. That bundle of myrrh was with me all through the night. It's a long night that you and I are in, isn't it? All through the Song of Solomon, the, when night, whenever night is mentioned, it speaks of his, his absence uh, as far as his, as his bodily presence is concerned. From just the time, the, the Song of Solomon is divided into three different songs, three different verses, I call it, the one verse is, is when he was here on earth, and the, the whole thing has to do when he was here on earth. And then the next part is when he went away and the night came. And then the, all that part of the song song and is what happened in the night. And then as we near the rest of it is when he's coming back to receive his bride. All through the night he was with me. A bundle of myrrh, giving sweet fragrance. And you know, there isn't anything that will strengthen us for the journey like the fragrance of his presence with us. Isn't it true? The fragrance of his presence. I tell the Lord sometimes when the way just gets a little hard, I say, Jesus, if you'll only stay with me, I can go through it. I feel I can go through anything if you'll just stay with me. But whatever you do, Lord, please don't withhold your presence from me. If you'll just give me the comfort of your love and the strength of your abiding presence, I can go through anything. And I feel that way about it, but Jesus, please don't. Don't, whatever you do, don't leave me. He promised never to leave us, didn't he? And he really doesn't. He really doesn't. Sometimes he just withdraws his conscious presence just to make us run after him a little harder. That's all. That's all. And when he draws his presence, he tells us where he is. He's just hid behind the lattice for a little while. But he's peeking through at us. And, and he's mindful of us. He's just as much with us as he was before. But, uh, but do you think when Jesus was hanging on the cross, when Jesus said to the Father, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you think God had forsaken Jesus? Why, never, ever, did Jesus mean more to the Father than he did right then and there in that hour? Never was the Father closer to him, but the Father had to withdraw his conscious presence while Jesus was becoming sin for you and for me because God is too holy to look upon sin, and he couldn't look on his only begotten Son while he was becoming sin for us. And he had to withdraw his conscious presence. But God was right there and watched over him that he was able to go through that thing in the will of God. And how perfectly he satisfied his heart. All through this night, listen, beloved.
of it, no matter how dark the night or how bitter the hours that you were passing through, it could never be harder or darker or more bitter than that little bundle of myrrh that promised to be with us all through the night. That's why, that's why it, it meant so much in the Orient when a, a lover gave to his beloved a little bundle of myrrh before he went on a trip or before he went on a journey. All the time that he was away, all during his absence, she carried that little bundle of myrrh with her wherever she went, day or night. She was never separated from her little bundle of myrrh. It was a token of his love to her. It was a token that he was suffering too while he was absent from her, while he was apart from her. But it was a token to her that he would come back, his, he would be with her all through the night, and then would return again. And still to this day in the Orient, when one wants to make known his love to another, and if she's slow to receive his advances, he'll put mud on the door of her home, thus showing the, to prove to her that with all of his heart, he means his love toward her, and he's suffering to be apart from her. And that's why uh, I, I like to say a little thing here that I, I, I know we have criticized, uh, I think unduly, some of our friends for little things that they carry with them, little tokens that they might carry and so on. But I have spent quite a bit of time in studying the origin of certain emblems that are used in the scripture. And for some time I had been studying the cross and the emblems of the cross and the meanings of the different crosses and why they were used at particular times. And I discovered that the first crucifixes that were worn and that were carried by the first mystics and devoted saints were just that they might, they carried it in their bosom or they carried it in their hand or put it someplace where every once in a while they would be pricked by the edges of the cross and thus reminded of his love, reminded of the suffering of this wonderful Savior, reminded of the myrrh and the bitterness that he endured for us and those old early mystics and saints and martyrs who suffered so much when they felt the prick of the crucifix. They said, oh, he suffered for me. I can go through this thing with him. And they'd carry a crucifix into the arena and into the Colosseum when they were going in to face the lions. And as they felt in their hands the prick of the cross, the prick of the cross, he suffered for me. He endured the cross for me. I can go through for him. I know, I know things are dissipated terribly, but some things in their origin were beautiful and sweet and pure. And so if someone to this day would want to carry a cross for some reason, to feel the prick of its edges, to remind them of Christ, to feel the prick of its edges, and have its edges say, this do in remembrance of me. I could love that, could you? I could appreciate that and I could accept that. Little do we know what's going on in a heart between a heart and its Savior, between that loved one and the beloved. So let everybody else alone and let them serve God as they will. Amen. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved unto me. He's with me all through the long night. The bitterness, the costliness of, of that, that myrrh. And I, I have been searching out, and I did that a long time ago, and just looked it up again to be real sure 
myrrh is, is the, the life or the gummy sap of the tree. And the way it's gotten in it, it's very best that they can get the best substance and essence is just to pierce the tree. And, and when the tree is pierced, then this, this substance oozes out of the tree one drop at a time, just like a drop of blood or a tear, just one drop at a time, and it's gathered. That's why it's so costly, and it's very bitter, but costly. Mother has it is so much in the life of our Lord, symbolic of bitterness, symbolic of death, symbolic of suffering. And if we're going all the way through with him, if we're going to tell him at the table, yes, Jesus, yes. And we've already told him that, my dear, there'll be myrrh and bitterness in every one of our lives. Yes, there will. But he wants us to accept it with sweetness and, and offer it back to him with praise and with worship and with adoration. I wonder how many of you have myrrh in your life today. Maybe you've been eating myrrh. You've been drinking myrrh from the very the first gift that was brought to Jesus in his birth. The wise men brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Myrrh. Myrrh was ministered to him all through his life. On the cross they gave him wine mingled with myrrh. When, when David the psalmist was caught up in the spirit and singing about him, he says, all of his garments smell of myrrh, aloes and casea out of the ivory palaces. They brought spices to anoint him, and one of the spices was myrrh. But Mary had already been there and had anointed him before he died so that his nostrils was full of the fragrance. Oh, listen, my dear. No matter what bitterness is in your life today, do you want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering? Or do you want to go to heaven without any bitterness, without sorrow, without trouble, without any hard things in your life to discover when you get there, well, I don't know the Lord in this relationship. When he talks about his suffering and when he lifts the fold back from his nail wound, I have no song to offer him. The other day the Lord told, made me to know the song that satisfies the beloved is a song that issues from suffering. What is the song of the redeemed? Unto him that loved us and has washed us from our sins in his own precious blood. Wounds, sacrifice, death, bitterness. And if we're going to have song to offer him, that song will issue from the fellowship of his suffering. And that, my dear, that we must know here. So if any of you are in the valley of sorrow, if any of you are going through suffering or some hard place today, oh, I pray, I pray there will be nothing in your spirit that will want to turn back, nothing in your spirit that will not yield or commit all or surrender all or lift with the, with the myrrh, let there come an offering of sweetness before the Lord. I, I, may I just hurriedly tell you one time, I went home for Christmas, and I was so tired, I didn't know if I'd get through that last Sunday of meetings or not. I just felt I had enough 
strength to get through that day and get all get on home and I was looking forward to the time of rest at home and it was Christmas and I could be with my loved ones and I'm with them so seldom. Well, I my father met me at the train and on the way home he said, Well, my dear, I don't know what awaits you. And I said, What, Dad? Well, he says, the town is just being ravished with an epidemic of influenza. And you just cannot. Well, I, my father met me at the train. And on the way home, he said, well, my dear, I don't know what awaits you. And I said, what, Dad? Well, he says, the town is just being ravished with an epidemic of influenza. And you just cannot get a nurse. You cannot find anybody to come into the home. And he said, I'm sorry to tell you, dear, but your brother has had the flu and he's gone into pneumonia. His wife, my very dear sister-in-law that went to be with the Lord since I'm with you, she had heart trouble and was sick for 10 years. And he says, dear May has the flu added to her heart trouble and their only child, Rosemary, has a very bad case of the flu. All three of them are in bed. We can't find a nurse or anybody to come in anywhere. I thought, I knew what Dad didn't say. I knew that. So Christmas. And immediately the Lord said to me, this is my birthday. And I said, yes, Jesus, it is your birthday. And immediately I knew it wasn't mine. It's, it's your birthday. And then he said, will you give me on my birthday the celebration that I would like on my birthday? I said, yes, Lord, what is it you want? Well, he said, the wise men brought me gold and frankincense and myrrh. I would like you to bring me some myrrh. And I knew what was ahead of me. And immediately the Lord said to me, but sweet myrrh, myrrh is a bitter thing. But all through the bitterness, I knew there wasn't to be one little teensy weensy bit of bitterness in the myrrh that I was bringing to him. It would be bitter myrrh to me, but sweetness to him. And I said, Lord, you know I'm so physically depleted. It seems to me I was never further down physically. And right away I was reminded, when God took Jesus to the cross, never was he more physically unfit for such an hour. He had been through Gethsemane. He had sweat drops of blood. Think what his heart and spirit were suffering at the betrayal of one of his own, the denial of one of his own. All night long in that awful agony, thrown into the prison and down in that old dungeon where they kept him in horrid old putrid place. Never was he so physically exhausted and unfit for that terrific thing. But God, come on, this is my will. And I want to tell you something else. He, he was the most beloved of the Father. Sometimes when people are going through bitter things and hard things and trials, some old gossip, excuse me, I don't really mean it that way, but they'll say, wonder what's in their life. Wonder what's covered up. Wonder why the Lord has to deal with them like this. What's in there? Wonder why it's all... Some, it's just God's judgment. 
something just we don't know anything about it, but God knows what it is. Ah, oh, the most beloved of the Father, the only begotten Son, the beloved of the Father, suffered more, suffered most, suffered more than you and I will ever be called on to suffer. Remember what it says about Lazarus? He whom thou lovest is sick. Not he whom you hate. Not he whom you want to judge. But he whom thou lovest is sick. Hallelujah. Say praise the Lord, will you? Sure, praise the Lord. Bitterness, bitterness. Yes, it's a bitter thing. But through your tears, we can offer him sweetness. We can offer him sweetness. Hallelujah. The Lord took me into that thing. I was home long enough to change my clothes and get into a washable dress and was taken over to the home of my brother. And for three days and three nights, I did not have that dress off. But the strength that he poured in, the strength that he gave, the life that he gave, oh, how he can minister, how he can help, how he can take us through. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. And then I... I, oh, it just all depends, you know, on, on how we interpret the things the Lord permits in our lives, how we, how we interpret it. There was dear old Job who says, he's, oh, he slept in me, yet I'll trust him. And I love the way Job says this, when the devil has tried me, I'll come forth as gold. Kid, could you imagine such a thing? What does it say? When, say it. When he hath tried me. He has tried me. Folks would try to tell you that God doesn't permit trial. God doesn't allow trial. God doesn't permit test. God doesn't allow test. He certainly does. It, it's 